Well, thank you. Uh, this is turning out to be a special occasion, it seems to me, with the Brandenburg Gate behind me and on the site of the uh, former Berlin Wall within a few meters of here, I think. Uh, I guess that's because this is about, in, in many ways, my talk is about freedom. Uh, and uh, I'm going to be talking about the democratization of finance. So I, I want to thank Allianz, uh, the American Academy, and uh, Campus Verlag for arranging this. So uh, what, I, what I want to talk about here uh, is what I wrote the book uh, about, Merkte für Menschen, was about uh, my sense of the uh, significance and importance of modern finance in our civilization. And a feeling I had that uh, the public didn't appreciate the importance of what our financial system does. Uh, that's not to say that everyone is good in finance or that everything is good that comes up as part of it. It's a system. It's a way of doing things that we have. So uh, the, the book is uh, really about, well, it's trying to dispel certain misunderstandings of finance and at the same time to talk about the trajectory that we are on toward a, a better civilization uh, connected with advances in finance. Finance is not about making money, I would say. It's about supporting activities. Any important activity has to be financed. Uh, it's hard to think of something important that one can do as a lone individual without access to other people, organizations, and resources. It's hard to think of any activity that doesn't require financing. I try hard to think. I, uh, I talk to my students about this. What, what could you do with no financing that would be important? What comes to mind is, well, one could always be a poet. Uh, one could, in fact, you don't need anything. You can memorize your poetry. You could be in solitary confinement. But then I think, well, you wouldn't really be a poet because you would have no impact, right? And so poets who we remember are people who had the support of publishers, uh, organizers, newspapers that wrote reviews, libraries, bookstores. It just branches out in so many ways. Uh, and so financing is behind poetry, realistically. It's hard to find, think of anything you can do without involving yourself in financing. So I had the sense before writing this book that this wasn't properly appreciated, how central finance is. We teach it in elementary uh, finance courses and emphasize certain things that are characteristic of a modern financial system. First of all, finance Financial systems very carefully define ownership rights. And when you own something, you have a clearer sense of what you have and what you can do. Finance creates shares in, in activities that involve many people. And so that means that people can participate as parts of groups and they can buy and sell these shares. They can move in and out of an activity. Uh, finance provides price discovery for, uh, for activities. It tells what something is worth, so you have a sense of value and uh, cost. It provides employee incentives uh, that incentivizes people to do something uh, that contributes to an organization. The natural incentives that we all have are idiosyncratic. How do we align incentives? And it, it involves also risk management. The, the world is fundamentally uncertain and most uh, important human activities are fundamentally uncertain. We can't even quantify the probabilities. And yet those risks matter and they can be inhibiting. For example, many people wouldn't become a poet <laughs> because that's a very risky endeavor. Uh, but society, uh, our modern society, flourishes because 
to the extent that it does because we have financial institutions and laws and customs that make these things happen. Now that, that's standard, I guess. Uh, the, uh, anyone who takes a finance course hears some of these things. But at the present time, there's a lot of negativity expressed. Uh, I think the present time is distinguished by the fact that we're going through a financial crisis. Uh, started around 2007 or 2008 and continues today. And, it, it, uh, and what to make of this? Well, I think that the financial crisis that we're going through is due to the, Im the imperfections that remain in our systems. We have been on a trajectory to increasingly sophisticated financial systems, uh, but it remains imperfect. Uh, we have still speculative bubbles. We have leverage that can get built up excessively in certain times. We have systemic vulnerability, uh, something that can only be understood or discovered when looking at the interdependencies of a whole financial system. Uh, so to me, these are all uh, problems that have to be solved with uh, more, and more of the same. We need more financial activities, more sophisticated contracts. Right now there's a mood towards saying we should simplify things because the complexity has gotten out of hand. Uh, well, complexity is of course a, a, cost, a cost to us, but I think that our society is better and better able to handle the complexity of financial contracts as we get more advanced uh, and as information technology improves. So the, the, the impulse that we hear today about simplifying, uh, of avoiding complex financial activities seems to me backwards. So I'm a little out of sync with the uh, general views uh, at the present time. Well, that's why I wanted to write a book. Part of what I'm emphasizing is I think that we're, the enlightenment that is making finance work better is an enlightenment that is now taking account of human behavior better. The, the, the biggest revolution in financial thinking over the last few decades, I think, is the development of behavioral finance, which is the application of psychology, psychological principles to, to finance. And the thing that we have to have is a view of human nature that's correct. Uh, ultimately, uh, people are very complicated. We're learning that through modern psychological and now neurological research. Uh, that uh, uh, modern civilization is a construct that channels human impulses in constructive ways. Uh, for example, a gambling impulse is channeled into a investing uh, impulse. Uh, so if, uh, people, a theme of my book is that people have good and bad sides to them and the progress of our civilization has been progress toward uh, expanding the ability of our institutions to focus these well. Uh, I'll give you an example, there's another book recently uh, by Steven Pinker called uh, uh, The Better Angels of Our Nature, who uses a reference to a lot of research in psychology and neuroscience. Did you know that there's a part of your brain that we could stimulate with an electrode and it would cause you uncontrollably to fly into a rage? This has been proven. Uh, they just give you a little stimulation in the right spot. You have to insert a wire. <laughs> you might not want this but uh, you would find yourself uncontrollably angry. So it's programmed, it's in your brain, ready to go. Uh, and Pinker emphasizes, he thinks there's also a rampage circuit, although maybe they haven't found how to stimulate that, that would cause you to fly into a rampage, and th let's not even think about that. Um, but civilization has become more gentle and more humane over the years, and it's not because these circuits have changed. It's because we've found ways not to let them get activated. What I think that the history of civilization has been, has been substantially a, a progress in 
ability of people to pursue their individual goals and form alliances, oh, that's alliance, I guess, form alliances with other people that have a structure to them that last, that are durable. Most things that you do that are of any value are things that unfold over years or decades. And, and you want to have people coming and joining and leaving the activity in an orderly manner. Uh, and uh, so I think that what's been happening, I, I have a view of finance as something like the hard sciences that get better and better incrementally as time goes by. Uh, economists who study innovation have emphasized how gradual the process is and that uh, ideas develop, but they're not implementable until many, many other little ideas uh, become worked out for them. So for example, right now the U.S. is going through a energy revolution with the development of oil shale and natural gas. And it's said that this is happening because of new drilling techniques, frac fracking and horizontal drilling. But then people say, well, that's been known for decades. So something has happened that's kind of invisible, that we've got a better process. We've kind of integrated them better. It's the same thing, I think, with finance. The basic principles of risk management, incentivization, price discovery are known. But to make that work well is something that involves a lot of small inno innovations. So the democratization of finance, you can look back in history and see a lot of examples in history that uh, illustrate the process. I'll start with the French Revolution in 1789. Uh, this was uh, at the time of the French Revolution, almost all of the property in France was owned either by an aristocracy or the church. Uh, that was inhibiting of uh, human activity. After the revolution, gradually the land holdings were split up. Land reform after that revolution was copied in countries all over the world. This was a democratizing change in the system of organization. Uh, in 1811, New York State adopted a securities law that guaranteed two things. One, the ability for anybody in New York State to form a corporation uh, for any business purpose with no, no questions asked. And secondly, which guaranteed limited liability for everyone. That means if you bought shares in a company, you would be guaranteed by a clear law that under no circumstances could you be sued for the failures of the company. And that opened up a, a whole array of investors. It opened up the whole idea of diversification. Before 1811, it was not necessarily a good idea to diversify your portfolio because one of them could come back and bite you. So you want to, you know, you open yourself more to litigation the more you, securities you own. The savings bank movement in the early 19th century, in the, starting in the UK and then spreading through Europe and the US, uh, was a movement creating banks that served small savers and individuals. It was largely a philanthropic movement because the banks then were not interested in helping small savers. The mutual fund movement, which started in the mid 20th century, is a movement that allowed s small individuals, small savers to diversify. I would include also other things like the progressive tax system, which gradually developed since the 1790s in the UK. It's really a risk management system. I think of it, it's public finance but it is uh, best thought of as risk management. It, it, you, know, you don't know as a young person whether you'll be wealthy or not. Uh, if you're wealthy, you're paying your other self in another state of nature who might not have been so successful. Uh, so I think of it as a risk management system. Um, and uh, finally, regarding philanthropy, I think we have important innovations encouraging philanthropy. Uh, that is, we have tax deductions for philanthropic com contributions. We also have structures like family foundations and uh, donor-advised funds that allow people to accumulate their, to get the tax deduction every year and accumulate the, the, the uh, money in a institution which is their own, under their own control and give it away later. 
that allows people to uh, be more thoughtful and uh, 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 effective in their philanthropy. And so these are things that have happened. I think that we want more things to happen like that, and that's what I'm really here to talk about. Now, even some of the most uh, connected people in finance have seemed to have doubts about about uh, Warren Buffett about modern com complex financial innovations. Warren Buffett is famous for having said that derivatives should be thought of as weapons of mass destruction. Uh, Paul Volcker, the former Fed chairman, uh, said a couple of years ago that he couldn't think of any innovation in finance that really mattered other than the automatic teller machine. Uh, so uh, so I, I thought what I'm going to do in the remaining uh, minutes is to talk about innovations n now and in the future to make it clear. I, I, I think some examples will help illustrate that we have an ongoing process of discovery and experimentation that is fundamental to the way we do things in society. And I'm going to emphasize things that, I, I'm going to start with things that have happened in the last two years since Paul Volcker made his famous statement doubting uh, the value of innovation. Uh, so let me begin. The rest of my talk is just going to be examples. Uh, so let me begin with the, my first example of a financial innovation in the last two years that I think is interesting. Any, anything, however, when I talk about new innovations, we don't yet know whether we've got it right. They're still experiments, but they're promising experiments. So my first example uh, is the Benefit Corporation. It is now two years old. I, you don't probably know what this is. I'll explain it in a minute. Uh, it's at this point only in the United States. However, I view it as a movement in the European direction. I'll explain that in a second. Uh, what is a benefit corporation? It is a corporation that is halfway between for-profit and non-profit. Right now, you've got to be one or the other. The idea here, it was, it, it's uh, created in the United States. It started out in the state of Maryland. Uh, our, our corporate law in the United States is divided up over 50 states. Now there are 11 states have benefit corporations. A benefit corporation, you can set it up for any social purpose as well as making profits. It is, uh, you can set it up for environmental protection or, uh, or community support. When you set up a benefit corporation, you write the charter, you write the social purpose, but then you are obligated to do that as part of what you do. The other side of it is you still hope to make a profit. It's a corporation, it's a for-profit corporation. Now this seems a little odd. Uh, financial theorists say, let me get this straight. There's no clear definition of what the aims of the corporation is. Should it be for profit? Uh, what percent is for profit? The law is vague about that. So this is an experiment. Uh, uh, I'll give you an example of a benefit corporation. One of them that was set up is called Grower's Secret. Uh, and this is in just the last two years, there's only a few hundred of these. Grower's Secret is a U.S. fertilizer company uh, that in its charter says that it wishes to help preserve the NPK balance of the planet. Do you know what that is? <laughs> Not many people know. Well, NPK means uh, nitrogen, uh, phosphorus, potassium. So. Some environmentalists are really concerned about this. It hasn't been publicized in the media, but this fertilizer company is guaranteeing that they will help preserve the, the planet uh, with this respect. Now, what is, uh, uh, but they're still trying to make money. This is different from the community interest company, which is developed in the UK uh, maybe 10 years ago. It, it's, that's a sort of nonprofit that allows paying for investors, but it caps what investors can receive. I th I, I, maybe I don't have time to really explain this as well as I should, but what I'm thinking is 
that the benefit corporation is kind of a move in the European direction in the US in the sense that European corporation has always, especially I'm thinking of Germany particularly, has had more of a social or community purpose than a for-profit purpose in the United States. So uh, German corporate law requires that the board, the Aufsichtsrat have representatives of labor on the board. So it's not just for-profit. The US doesn't do that. But the problem with the German law is that it specifies what the social purpose is. I don't know if it's going to function as well as the benefit corporation. Well, we, we will see. Uh, I'm hopeful that these companies will make a lot of money. The thing you have to recognize is that people want to make, that's one of the, social, one of the things about people. They're not entirely philanthropic. So we have to match an institution to people's psychology. And I'm thinking that the Benefit Corporation may do that. We'll just wait and see and see whether it has some successes. My second example is the social impact bond. This is also within the last two years. Although the idea was first proposed by a New Zealand economist, Ronnie Horish, in the late 1990s. It took it a 10 years to actually happen. There's a nonprofit in the United Kingdom called Social Finance that operates a bit like an investment bank and it tries to solve social problems in the UK. It tries to identify a problem, bring together people that can uh, solve the problem and arrange financing through the government in a form of a social impact bond. So I'll give you an example. The Peterborough prison was one site they picked. That's a prison outside of London that is particularly bad in its reincarceration rate. Prisoners are sent to jail there for like a year for some theft or some minor, well, not, not huge crime, but uh, they spend a year in jail, they let them out of the prison, and you know what happens? They're right back in jail in six months. This is crazy. The, the UK government has tried to find some way of, of solving this, but they're not really, somehow not focused on it or... Uh, uh, so social finance lined up a number of companies that can provide social work and help for these people. And then it went to the Ministry of Justice in the UK and asked them to create a social impact bond which pays investors only if the Peterborough prison uh, reincarceration rate goes down a certain amount in the next six years. Uh, and they found investors uh, who, who would provide the money. So it's, it's like a creative investment banking, solving a problem. It's a really a social problem. So when they came to the Ministry of Justice in the UK, they said, we've got this whole plan. We've got investors who will send money uh, to the agencies that will work with the prisoners. We're privatizing the whole thing. All we need from you is a promise to pay if it works, all right? So now we have a private sector trying to find a solution that works because they don't get paid if it doesn't work. It's too soon to tell because uh, uh, it's only two years into this. I'm excited about it. The third example of financial innovation in the last two years. This one is maybe a little bit speculative, but let me tell you about it. It's called crowdfunding. What it's trying to do is expand on the experience of a number of internet sites that allow people to, uh, small investors, to invest in highly risky projects, to behave like venture capitalists. I'll give you an example. There's kiva.org that allows you to make a small loan to some poor farmer in some developing country. And you can look over the website and you'll see their applications and you can loan money to this poor person. You might lose the whole thing, but it's not going to hurt you that much. It's, it's kind of a game you could play. Uh, and people are finding this exciting. Well, the, the, the crowdfunding is now trying to expand the scope of that kind of activity so that it could become real venture capital. Instead of having venture capital firms dominating the financing of new business, we'll open it to crowds on the internet. And there will be an internet discussion so I'm talking particularly about a U.S. law that was just uh, enacted 
uh, called the Jumpstart Our Business Startups Act. And what it emphasizes a lot is preventing the exploitation of ignorant investors. The, and so they have protections. The worry is that if you allow crowds to invest, they won't know what they're doing and they'll lose a lot of money. Well, I think though that it's, it's an exciting thing because it reminds me of the Wikipedia experience. The Wikipedia was an encyclopedia written by everyone. You know, I've written some of it, maybe many of you have written some of it. It sounded like a wild idea when they first tried it, but you probably use it, right? I think it's, it's very important. We've discovered that crowds of people with the right kind of structure can be very creative and constructive. So I'm hoping that crowdfunding will work. Uh, the, 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 uh, the next art, art example I have from the last two years, well, it's not quite an innovation, but I want to mention it. Um, and this is the GDP-linked warrants that were issued by Greece in February of this year. As part of the restructuring of the Greek debt in the current financial crisis, the uh, Greek government has sold, or they attach them and they're now tradable to the general public, warrants that pay the, to the investor as a function of the future growth of Greek GDP. Uh, so this means that if you buy the warrant, you are hoping that the GDP growth in Greece will exceed some threshold which is specified in the warrant. And if not, you don't get paid. Kind of reminds me of a social impact bond, but it's different. What it is is a me method for the Greek government to uh, pay on its debts in a way that's contingent on their success so that if the Greek economy continues to suffer, they won't have to pay. But if they are successful, they, they, they can pay and will pay. Um, it, I'm saying th this is not exactly an innovation. It's kind of, well, maybe it is. There may be some aspects of its structure. But there was an earlier example in 2005 as part of its debt restructuring. Uh, the country of Argentina uh, issued warrants on its GDP uh, and sold them to international investors. That's a famous example because uh, it would have been a wonderful investment uh, if you could go back in a time machine and make that. Uh, people were very pessimistic about Argentina after its financial crisis in 2002. But it turned out that Argentina has just recovered spectacularly and they've paid investors a large amount of money. So that's the hope for Greece as well. But it, it'll be interesting to watch these warrants and how they're priced. Um, uh, so that's another, do so you, you see how much has gone on in the last two years? Uh, all these things I've talked about are only two years old. Uh, it, it's not, these things aren't talked about that much in the general public. There's so much focusing in the news media on the financial crisis, uh, on the subprime crisis, on the European sovereign debt crisis, on bailouts, uh, and, but those aren't the most exciting things that are happening in my mind. Uh, mo most, not the most interesting thing. Uh, I guess you, in some sense I'm talking about something that is sometimes called financial engineering. It's about trying to solve problems using a technology which is in finance. Uh, so uh, let me uh, now move to the last part of my talk which is my sense of what kind of financial innovations might happen in the future. Uh, and let me, uh, uh, I talk about these in my book. They're more speculative. Uh, but, uh, you know, as, as the world progresses and as information technology makes more and more things happen, I think we're going to see stunning and exciting new, uh, new technological innovations. The next 50 years is a unknown to us. I tell my students, I teach a finance course at Yale to undergraduates, which you can take, by the way, it's up on the web, free uh, for anyone. Um, and it's, um, I tell them that in the next 50 years, the information revolution is going to be so powerful that it's going to totally change our society. I think we have to deal with that constructively and, and think about how we can uh, make for uh, better financial institutions that will be con uh, move ahead with these 
uh, innovations and make our lives better. So the first thing I wanted to talk about in that context, because I've, I've just mentioned the Greek warrants, is an idea that I've developed with, um, it's similar to other ideas, but in the form that I've developed it with uh, Canadian economist Mark Kamstra, we call trills. What we're proposing is that governments ex uh, change their way of financing their activities to diminish debt and move to something more equity-like. In particular, we think that governments should start selling shares in their gross domestic product. And a trill is very simple. It's a one trillionth share of gross domestic product. So that uh, in the United States, it, it would be paid in domestic currency. In the United States, the uh, GDP last year was $14.5 trillion. So that means the trill would pay a dividend of $14.50. Uh, next year, who knows? It will be uh, uh, whatever the GDP is divided by a trillion. Uh, in Canada, the uh, GDP was something like $1.80 in Canadian dollars, uh, $1.8 trillion in Canadian dollars. So they would pay $1.80 Canadian to investors. And these would be traded, and uh, uh, that's the idea. Now, why is this a good idea? It's a good idea in the same way that corporations issue shares, and that's a good idea. Because it deleverages the invest and it spreads risk from the country to uh, international investors. Uh, so instead of having uh, the situation we have now is that governments use debt exclusively to finance their activities. So that puts them in a leveraged position, which is unnecessary. Modern financial theory suggests one can do better than that. So let's think as an example. Suppose Greece had financed all of its uh, uh, borrowing through trills rather than through what they actually did, which is both short and long-term government bonds. Well, they wouldn't have had the refinancing problem that struck them in uh, 2009 because they, 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 are, they have perpetual equity. It's like shares. They don't, they don't have to pay it back. They only pay a share of their GDP. The whole downward spiral of the Greek economy happened because investors started to lose confidence, and that created a refinancing problem, which caused the budgetary crisis, which only worsened people's fears about default. Uh, so we would have had a better system. Uh, I think that... Uh, advanced countries should start issuing trills as a, as a movement ahead. We should start selling shares in GDP. Uh, and it seems like a relatively simple thing, but uh, I've presented this in government uh, agencies and I've listened to their response, and it seems to me that uh, I didn't hear any objections that were substantive. Uh, but there's a, there's a conservatism that inhibits a movement ahead in financial innovation, so it doesn't happen quickly or fast enough. The next idea, I think that we should be moving ahead with different kinds of mortgage finance that protects homeowners better. We're seeing real tragedies now. There's been recent news stories about Spain where people who borrowed to buy houses are being evicted and thrown out in the street, and there have been suicides as a result. Uh, why is this happening? Why did this financial crisis hit homeowners so hard? Well, part of it was that they were, the, the financial system encouraged people to take leveraged, undiversified investments in housing. This was the atmosphere uh, in many countries around the world just five years ago. People would be fearful of not investing in a house. They would invest with a 10 to 1 leverage in a house in one city. And of course, when prices fall, they become bankrupt. They, they've lost everything. It's a predictable response to leverage. So we should think of some way to allow homeowners to proceed without exposing themselves to the kind of risk that really led to this crisis. It led to this crisis because as home prices fell, Homeowners suddenly felt that they had lost everything. Their life savings are wiped out. And worse than that, they, they're in, in a hole. Uh, so they stopped spending. 
Uh, and then when they stop spending, the economy starts to decline and, and the whole thing gets worse. And then the government puts in an austerity campaign because the government finances, because the government is leveraged and their finances are in disarray. So the whole thing spirals down. And then we can't do anything about it uh, because the, uh, uh, we don't have a system in place to give people workouts on their mortgages. So they end up foreclosed on. The proposal that I have in the book for a continuous workout mortgage is merely to set up plans for a workout, uh, a pre-planned workout. So I have what's called a continuous workout mortgage, uh, which is a mortgage with, that specifies when you buy a house, you get a mortgage to buy the house and you have a, a debt, a balance. If the price of your house goes down as measured by a home price index, then you will uh, find that your debt automatically goes down and your payment automatically goes down so that you can't be underwater because of an aggregate uh, home price decline. Uh, so this again is just, I think, more enlightened uh, finance. Uh, now, uh, you might ask, why would, and I'm talking about private mortgages, not government mortgages. This is just a, an idea for the private sector, although the government might facilitate it through its regulation. You might ask, well, why would a mortgage issuer want to give homeowners a break like that? Well, it makes a lot of sense, actually, because it turns out that if people default on their mortgages, it ends up imposing huge costs on the lender, on the neighborhood, on society. It, it's well documented that foreclosures are extremely costly. So we want to protect them and prevent that. We might also ask, well, how can a issuer of mortgages afford to give workouts to lower the mortgage balance to all the people whose houses value has fallen. Well, that's an investment problem which is easily handled by modern finance. One thing is that the mortgages could be securitized and sold off to investors. Investors who would then judge uh, the likelihood of repayment. Another thing is that we can have uh, derivative markets for uh, real estate that would help and mortgage issuers to hedge themselves, mortgage issuers of continuous workout mortgages to hedge themselves against declines in home prices. I know that this can happen because this is one of the things that I've done. In 2006, I and my colleagues worked with the Chicago Mercantile Exchange and we created futures markets for single family homes in 10 US cities. And it's now trading in Chicago. This means, by the way, uh, you could take either side of the U.S. housing market from Germany. You don't have to go to the U.S. What if you wanted to invest in U.S. real estate? Pick a city, go to the, your broker and just buy a uh, position in, uh, in one of our futures markets. Uh, now, uh, uh, let me go on to another idea. I'm, I'm getting more radical, but um, I think this is, we're, I'm talking about the next coming decades, so what should we do about our problems? Uh, one of, I think maybe the biggest problem that we face uh, around the world today is the problem of rising income inequality. And this was the, uh, this was the complaint that uh, the Occupy Wall Street movement or the other Occupy, Wall, uh, Occupy movements around the world emphasized the world seems to be getting much more unequal, uh, the, uh, especially in the U.S., but it's happening in Europe and other places as well. Uh, this is not a good thing for society. That uh, Some degree of inequality isn't bad because it partly, to some degree, because it incentivizes people to work. But, uh, but uh, I think that we want to put limits on it as a society because it may get much worse uh, in the 19, late 1940s, Norbert Wiener, who was a mathematician at MIT, wrote a book called Cybernetics, which was in one of the early uh, treatises on computer science. And this was right after Hiroshima and Nagasaki when the atom bombs were dropped. And at the end of the book, he, in the epilogue, he says he's worried. He, he read, he's written a whole book about computers, but he said he was worried about what it would do. Uh, 
and he said that he actually didn't know which is more dangerous, the computer or the atom bomb. What he was worried about is that machines replace people. A person can spend a lifetime developing some skill or some uh, t uh, talent, hoping to sell that in the marketplace, the labor marketplace, but it could be replaced by, by computers that are ever more sophisticated. Now, this sounds maybe fanciful, and maybe you, you may be thinking, it hasn't happened yet. Um, Norbert Wiener, Wiener wrote this in the 1940s, and everything still seems okay, but the computer technology is going ahead so fast right now that I think maybe we should worry about it. So um, my proposal is that we start setting up financial structures that will help protect people from this kind of uh, uh, shock to their, to their lives. So one proposal is livelihood insurance. Insurance companies should set up an expansion of disability insurance. They already offer disability insurance, which protects you against specific illnesses or, or injuries that would protect that would prevent your earning a livelihood. But we could generalize that to include other risks to your livelihood, that, that some index of, of wages of people in a certain occupation declines. I call that livelihood insurance. That's all completely in the future now. But it, it would help ad address the, the deep problem that we have, that inequality may get worse. And we have no plan to deal with that in any country. This would be a plan, and it can work largely through the financial sector. I'm going to talk about one more proposal, and then I'll open this up to questions. Uh, livelihood insurance was a private sector for an insurance company uh, idea. The inequality insurance, or inequality indexation, is my last idea, and this is an idea for the government. Uh, I think that governments today should set in motion a plan to uh, increase taxes on the wealthy in their country contingent on inequality getting worse. Uh, so it could be a plan that has no effect today. It's a plan for the future. The reason I want to do this uh, is because I think that it's easier to do these things in advance before the problem hits. Uh, the, uh, the uh, psychologist Trope has um, uh, d done a theory of this that uh, it's called temporal construal theory. It turns out that human beings are much more idealistic about the future than today. And if we ask you hypothetical questions, what do you think we should do if inequality gets 100% worse? Uh, people will answer in an idealistic way. But if you ask about what should we do today, they don't want, they don't want to do anything. Uh, so I think that's what we have to do. We have to just set up a contingency plan. Uh, and the government can uh, make a, a plan for the indefinite future that would automatically raise taxes on the wealthy, but only if they get a lot more wealthy. Um, uh, at least, uh, it, let me say that that might sound implausible to you, but a lot of implausible ideas have actually happened if you look at history. And at least, I have a, uh, this is a proposal to deal with what might be an extremely important problem. So uh, uh, I've just, uh, let me conclude and open this to questions, but what I, let me just summarize that what I've tried to do is to present a view of financial progress as a sequence of experiments and inventions that involve many details, getting them right, inventions that facilitate human activities. They, they finance constructive activities that motivate people right, respond right to uh, shocks to the, to, to the system, and, and just uh, build for a, a better society. So I'll stop and uh, uh, invite questions.